Okay, like I said, thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Shelby Carlson. I'm the Freight Chief Development Educator for Henderson, Knox, McDonough, and Warren counties in Western Illinois. Um, and I want to welcome you all and thank you for coming. I'm sorry, I at some point must have muted myself there. Um, thank you for coming and taking part in our career exploration series where we learn about um, a variety of careers that exist in agriculture. Today, we have a group of panelists who are joining us um, from a variety of ag companies across Illinois. Um, the, and many of these companies reach beyond that. Um, and they are gonna share with us a little bit about um, their job and, and as we work through the questions. Um, just so you know, as some of you have joined us, um, I do have it currently set where you are unable to unmute yourself. That is to help keep down on the background noise that we might experience while our panelists are kind of sharing with you. When we do get to the question section, I will change that setting and invite you all to unmute yourself. Um, in that time, if you have questions that you would like us to ask, um, we will either go ahead and put those in the chat box um, to myself, we do have the chat kind of locked down so you can chat with myself or um, with some of those who are also set as our co hosts to help me facilitate today. Um, if it's specifically related, we may kind of ask the, the presenters to, to expand upon that. Otherwise, we may save it to the end for our question section. Um, it's not been an issue thus far, but I just invite you all to remember that we um, are very lucky to have these panelists with us here. So please kind of maintain this productive, respectful environment that we've done such a great job to form. Um, so without any more um, further ado and speaking from myself, um, I would like to introduce our panelists um, and then get started with our questions. Um, so with us today, we have Chris North with John Deere. We have Amy Newell with Compier Financial, Jimmy Castile with Bear, and then Dan Mitchell of CNH Industrial. So I would invite you all to just um, go ahead and unmute. And at first, can you tell us a little bit about the company that you work for and your role within that company? So I guess I'll start. Um, Jimmy Castile, <clears throat> I started. Uh, with Legacy Monsanto in uh, 1999, uh, interning uh, with them, and then started full time uh, in 2002 when uh, Monsanto purchased DeKalb seed corn. I was working uh, internship with DeKalb at the time. Uh, was hired um, to work in the trade integration group within uh, Monsanto. And like I said, in 2002, and I have currently worked in four different roles within Monsanto. Now with the purchase of Bayer, purchasing Monsanto with Bayer. Um, I'm currently the Learning Center Agronomist um, in Monmouth at our facility there, where we do a lot of tours and trainings uh, for both uh, growers and our seed dealers and uh, seed partners. I'll go ahead and go next. I'm Amy Newell. I work for Compere Financial. Uh, we're a part of the farm credit system. So we merged back in 2017 with um, First Farm Credit and then two companies up in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, so we are member owned and we um, do services such as crop insurance, lending, uh, appraisals, and then um, also provide tax and accounting up in the Wisconsin area. So my current role is a financial officer and I started with Compere in 2018 after I graduated from Illinois State University. Um, I started as an associate so I went through a training program where I got placed, um, started in the normal office and now work in the Sycamore office but I went through training for crop insurance appraisals credits and also the sales team and got placed in the sales role. I'm All Dan right. Mitchell. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, thanks, Chris. I, I'm Dan Mitchell. I work for CNH Industrial in Racine, Wisconsin. 
I at CNH Industrial, if you're not familiar, you're probably familiar with some of our brands, which is Case IH, New Holland, Case Construction, Aveco, FPT Engines, uh, and some other brands that we sell uh, across the United States and in all countries across the world. I've been in this company since 2014. I interned when I was in college. And my current role is technical training manager uh, for North America construction segment. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris North, and I started working full time for John Deere in January of 2020. So I'm currently in what is known as the marketing and customer support development program. I'm current, I'm in my second role right now where I'm working in DTAC at the seating factory in the Quad Cities. DTAC is who the dealers call when they can't figure something out. It stands for Dealer Assistant, Dealer Technical Assistance Center. Wonderful, thank you. And as we have seen kind of be the trend with some of our agriculture professionals, um, they can't always count themselves to be in an office on a specific day. And so that's why you will see um, Chris is sitting in a nice quiet place in the truck today. Um, and Chris, that has been a trend that we've seen. So that's great. Um, I'm hoping each of you can share with us how you decided to pursue a career in agriculture. So I, I grew up on a family farm um, here in Monmouth, Illinois, just south of town. And um, when I graduated high school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I uh, went to the junior college at Carl Sandburg College in Galesburg, Illinois. Um, went there for a year and then decided to take a couple years off to figure out what I wanted to do. And so I, I farmed on the family farm for two years with my mom's brothers and really became, you know, growing up, I always liked being on the farm. So then I decided, you know, to maybe pursue a career in ag. So that's when I uh, enrolled in actually a two-year associate, associates program at the junior college. And uh, during that time is when I got my internship uh, with DeKalb. And my boss at the time basically talked me into going on to get my four-year degree. Um, so I transferred to Western Illinois University in Macomb uh, and uh, got my degree in um, crop science with a minor in econ ag economics. And I was fortunate enough, uh, the same boss that talked me into going back to school um, offered me a full-time job in January of the spring that I was going to graduate in. So the last semester of college, I was working full-time plus finishing my last semester of school. But uh, for 20 years later, I've still been with that, I've been with that company. So it's been, it's been a good, ag has been great to me so far. Yeah, my situation is very similar. I grew up on a family farm in West Central Illinois, um, small town of Williamsfield. So my family farms there, uh, grew up in 4-H and FFA, um, just always enjoyed the ag industry and what it has to offer. So after high school, I went to Carl Sandburg College. I went there for a year and a half. Um, wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do when I went there. Um, went there for my associate's degree, knew I wanted to go into agriculture, just didn't know what part. Um, so I interned at a local bank back home and realized that I really like the finance side of things. So when I graduated from Sandburg, I transferred to Illinois State University and majored in ag business and have my bachelor's degree from there. And I grew up uh, around Colchester, Macomb, Illinois area. I think the question for me is I, I never really thought of anything but agriculture because I grew up in that area. I, I, I was in FFA in high school. I was in collegiate FFA in college and Ag Met Club at Western Illinois University uh, where we had the Farm Expo every year. And I was heavily involved in that too. It, it, ag careers, a lot of people, when they think of ag careers, they think of farmers. And, and while that is the crux of everything agriculture related, there are several types of careers and things around that. So uh, I would say for me, it was, it was not a question of whether I wanted to work in an ag related career or not. It was a question of what did I want to do in an ag related career? Uh, 
I have a similar story to those who have already spoken. Grew up in a farming family in southeastern Henry County. Uh, both of my parents worked in ag and then transitioned into different positions. Ag has always been a big part of my life, though. I was a 10-year 4-H member, which is part of how I got to know Shelby and Amy. And it made me realize that in FFA, how much more there was to ag than just farming, like Dan alluded to. I graduated from the University of Illinois with a degree in mechanical engineering. But through that time, I was lucky enough to do four internships with deer. So working full time for deer seemed like an easy choice. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing some of those experiences with us all. Um, and and absolutely, I would say as you continue to try to find the path, if you know that you're interested in ag, but want to find that path and you haven't um, been with us for our first two segments, feel free to check those out. We'll listen to these speakers. And then we've got two more segments that talk about the variety of careers that, that take place in agriculture. Um, so some great opportunities to explore a little bit more. Um, the next question I have for you all is, can you tell us what a typical day looks like for you? Um, and I have been told by some people in ag that there is no typical day and that's okay too. And if you can expand on that, that'd be great. So I guess we'll just keep the order rolling. Um, so yes, a typical day for me is it changes about every two days um, with the seasons in ag being in production ag that I'm in. Um, basically, if we were to start in January, in the first of the year, I'm meeting with our uh, agronomists and our sales reps from all of our brands within Bear, whether it's DeKalb, Channel, Stone, or our uh, corn states where we have smaller seed companies license our products. And I will work with them to see what types of demonstrations and plots that their customers are wanting so then that we can plan those out. So then in the winter time or in you know, January, February timeframe, I will create those protocols. And then moving into spring, we will plant those protocols for them along with some of our own at the, at the research center, just you know, looking at different things such as you know, high management corn and soy, nitrogen utilization in corn. Plus we have all of Bear's newest traits and pipelines um, out at the farm as well. And then around uh, June, July and August, we will have um, multiple people come out. Uh, it was definitely different last year. We weren't able to do it that, but we, typically we have between five and 7,000 people a year come through, um, you know, to look at their plots and for us to talk about, you know, dif different systems trials that we have with them. So that keeps us busy through the summer as long as, and then we still have to maintain those plots as well, um, whether there's certain treatments we need to do on those, but then also bring groups through to talk about those as well. Um, during Farm Progress show later in September, your August, late September, August, uh, we're pretty busy with international groups coming through the farm. We typically have uh, probably two to 3,000 international guests come through that are usually here for Farm Progress that spend a week or two in the U.S. Um, so we talk about U.S., um, you know, things we do in the U.S. And I also learn a lot from them what they do. A lot of them are Brazil and Argentina farmers. Um, so we learn different ways they do things as well. So and then we move into fall where we're gathering more data, um, harvest data, and then this, the just then we will summarize our trials that we do for the companies and for ourselves, and we'll write uh, data reports, send those out for sales teams to use in the winter um, to benefit you know them to helpfully make the sale for the next year. So yes, it changes, just a revolving circle. Um, you know, there, there's no day that's basically the same for production ag and and, and what we do, but I really enjoy it. So for my job, um, why I like the company I work for is because it's a desk job, but you also get to go out in the field. So uh, most of my days are in the office. Today I am working from home, um, but most of the days are in the office. We're open 8 to 4.30, so clients can walk in, come talk to me if they want. New clients can come in as well. Um, and just so we have someone there that can talk about loans with them. Um, we were about half capacity in our offices till about a week ago so now we can all come back and work um, but we have the flexibility to work and make our own schedules um, versus home and in, in the office so typical day um, it changes it's not ever the same but it's 
uh, kind of uniform and just like the activities that we get to do. So working with farmers, um, I'm up in Sycamore, which is DeKalb County, Northern Illinois. So up in my area, uh, we have a lot of farmers. But we also have a lot of investor style clients. So I work with um, any kind of organic producers, regular row crop, um, any kind of produce, ag tourism, and then also just the landlords as well. Um, typical day then check emails, answer all the phone calls that come in with client questions. Right now we work a lot with the PPP loans and those um, applications coming in. Um, when the auctions start rolling, we get to go out and uh, visit with clients, talk to them about the auctions, uh, go to the auctions and be there in case someone buys and needs financing, go out and do farm visits, ride in the tractors, combines with any of the farmers. Um, but a lot of it is you know, at the desk and inputting all of the loan information when someone comes in and says, hey, I wanna buy this 80 acres that came up for sale. Um, it's collecting the tax returns, collecting the balance sheets, um, figuring out where the farm is, what the value is on it, and um, running their, basically running their credit and uh, doing all the financial analysis on the back end of that. All right. Well, I'm going to keep with the same theme and say no, no two days are <laughs> identical, but I will say that our, my goals are the same. So as a technical training manager, uh, what I do is I manage a team of people and I myself also train dealership technicians. Uh, so the, the men and women who are going out to fix machines when they're broken down, uh, that's what I do is I train those people uh, how some of the machines work, how to troubleshoot and diagnose them, how to repair them, how to use the service information that's available to them, whether it's operator's manuals, service manuals, service bulletins, that type of thing. Uh, so every day revolves around that to some extent. So uh, it could be that I'm delivering the training either online, virtually, or in person. It could be that I'm developing the training. It could be that I'm scheduling my team for the training that they need to do based on our dealership demands. It could be looking at training data and, and pulling some of those numbers to look at KPIs, key, key performance indicators for the company and for our dealerships. It could be reviewing some of that information. It might be budgeting another day. Uh, equipment inventory, because we have to have equipment to train on, so we have to be able to manage our own inventory of equipment, make sure that it's staying current with current production machines. So uh, every day is a little bit different and relates back to that. But it's not just in that role. So we also do a lot of resource leveraging within CNH. So I might go to the plant for a few weeks on products that I train on and help with quality audits. I might work in our technical help desk uh, area to answer questions coming in from dealers if that person's out on vacation for a week or two. So uh, every week is a little bit different. There's always new challenges. And that's, to me, what makes it exciting. Great. Thanks, Dan and Chris. Yep. I'm going to echo what everyone else has said. You know, no two days are the same. Last year, I actually had a different job. I worked in EDPR, which is Early Detection Problem Resolution for John Deere Harvester Works. So I worked with engineering, but then also customers out in the field who were essentially demoing brand new pre-production combines to try and help us figure out what needed tweaked before they went into final production. So I spent a lot of time on the phone with my customers and then engineering, trying to basically translate farmer into engineering to help them understand what was going on. And it was actually a place where my background came in super helpful but I also spent a lot of time out on the road working on the machines to make updates as engineering decided, we wanna change these parts, this software needs updated. And then also fixing the machines when things went wrong, which inevitably happens. So it was a really good experience because I got customer face, I got to leverage my background, I got to spend time on the road in the middle of a pandemic. It was nice to get out of Illinois for a while. Um, overall, though, I loved the hands-on 
approach. I love the hands-on and the fact that I got to represent deer to some of our customers. Great, thank you all for sharing that. That does sound absolutely like you are echoing what I've heard um, from your colleagues across a variety of ag sectors is that um, there's never a typical day for you. Um, so the next question I have for you, and as I mentioned, um, we've got people joining us from all over the country, not just from Illinois. Um, so I would ask, is your job, um, whether within that company or within similar companies, specific to the Midwest, or could it be done anywhere in the country? So with the uh, learning centers that Bear has, um, they currently had uh, learning centers in Illinois, one in Illinois, in Monmouth, Illinois, one in Huxley, Iowa, uh, one in Gothenburg, Nebraska, that focused on dry land and irrigation water utilization, and also one in Scott, Mississippi, that dealt with a lot with cotton and soybean research. So um, those are kind of the four we have, but my what I do next step would be honestly uh, being a technical agronomist or get into sales with another company. So it's kind of a stepping stone uh, or with another brand within Bear. Um, so it can it can basically what we're doing could, is what uh, basically an agronomist or salesman would be doing throughout the U.S. with any company. You know, just getting the needs of the customer and, and putting those pots out somewhere wherever it could be. There's a lot of places you know, in Texas or somewhere, they have little farms on their, on their own where they're putting out the same types of research and demonstrations to bring their customers through. With my job, um, Farm Credit covers the entire U.S. Uh, Compere covers um, half of Illinois and then Wisconsin and Minnesota. We are the third largest farm credit system or in the farm credit system. Uh, but there is other farm credits in northern Illinois, or sorry, southern Illinois, Illinois you will find um, Farm Credit Service of, of America, or sorry, that's in Iowa. Um, farm Credit Service of Illinois is the one that is in southern Il Illinois. Um, like I said, of America is in Iowa, mid-America is in Indiana, and they cover just a variety of different, um, different areas, but we are all based out of the territory. So each Farm credit is different just depending on what um, state you live in, but it is covered throughout the, uh, throughout the U.S. So what I do can and is done uh, all over the U.S. and Canada and around the world. So uh, m me and my team are based here in Wisconsin, but we travel several times to Canada, California, Texas, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, to deliver training for our dealerships at our training centers or our partner college locations. And, and then there's, so, so I'm the North America training manager for construction. There's a training manager for Asia Pacific. There's a training manager for South America. There's a training manager for Europe. So they're all doing the same thing uh, I'm doing and my team's doing, yes, in a different language, but they're doing the same thing. So if you want to get in this profession, as long as you speak the language, you can do it almost anywhere. With what I'm doing right now and what I did last year, both could effectively be done anywhere in the country. However, being in the Quad Cities allows proximity to the factories when we're not in the office, which is helpful if I need to actually be able to see something on a machine or actually reach out and touch something, uh, I'm a very tactile learner. I gain a much deeper understanding of something if I can actually put my hands on it as opposed to just seeing pictures of it. So could it be done? Yes, but it is easier to do it where the resources are. And sometimes the job requires travel. I know last year, in a six month span, I spent about 17 weeks on the road and I was in 13 different states. So it all just depends on the day because again, there's no typical day. And travel is one thing that um, if I can kind of change up my question order, which I'm going to, um, one thing that I hoped you guys could expand a little bit on. Um, 
So Chris and Dan, it seems like travel is maybe a little bit more of a crucial part of your job. Um, can you share with us maybe the um, either the furthest place you've been or the most unique? Um, and then Amy and Jimmy, I'll ask you to comment on if travel is at all part of your position. Yeah, so uh, the furthest place I've been, I think, is Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is uh, pretty far north in the Saskatchewan province. It actually reminds you a lot of Texas uh, when you look at the how everything's laid out. Buildings are spread out. You know, you think of cities like Chicago and uh, and uh, even places like Peoria. You know, it's it's not building on top of building on top of building. Yeah, the downtown area is, but you get out to the edges of town, it's more spread out. And when I was in Texas, it reminded me of that. It, everything is really more spread out. So uh, I really like both of those areas. Uh, my favorite is probably when I spent a couple of weeks out in California and it wasn't necessarily for the job. It was because I was able to go through the Redwoods uh, the weekend between the two <laughs> jobs. So uh, that was kind of nice. Uh, you get to see uh, a lot of the country uh, on someone else's dime, so to say. But uh, I travel in a normal year about 25-30% of the time. So the furthest place I've been for my job is probably Great Falls, Montana last summer. So some of the machines I was working with last year went on what's known as the wheat run, where farmers throughout the central United States hire people who specifically harvest crops. They don't necessarily farm, they just run combines. And so was out there working on them. Um, I didn't put it to a map, but I think Great Falls is about 1200 miles from the Quad Cities. And my job, I got really lucky last year. My boss allowed me a lot of flexibility to kind of make my own decisions and do what I needed to do. So, you know, in a certain frame, time frame, I may be on the road 75% of the time when the machine is in season, whether it be a planter or a combine. Great, thanks, Chris. Amy, Jimmy, does travel, is travel involved in your roles at all? Uh, with my role, uh, local travel, I mean, just ask to the farmers. So within the, you know, 45, 50 mile radius, uh, we travel day to day. Um, as far as like state to state travel, when I was in the training program and I worked in the normal office, I did travel up to Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, so we went up to, um, Mankato, Minnesota was one of the one of our larger offices. And so I went up there to um, train with some of our different team members up there. And then also our headquarters are in Wisconsin and Sun Prairie, just outside of Madison. So we do have meetings up there, uh, but most of our meetings are within our territory. So between Minnesota and Wisconsin and Illinois are where I travel. So currently, you know, with my current role, there really isn't much travel, you know, except maybe, you know, St. Louis for meetings. But prior to, I, I worked in small plot research uh, with Monsanto from 2002 till, till 13, 2013. I was, we, I was able to spend a month, of the month of January in Hawaii um, for se seven years. So I've been to three of the islands in Hawaii. I've uh, been there seven times total. And then I've also been to our research farm in uh, Ponce, Puerto Rico. I spent a month there in January as well. So that was a really good perk uh, back in the day, pre, uh, pre kids. And when I was just a bachelor and, uh, or just married, but no kids, you know, to get to go spend the month of January at our, uh, one of our research facilities in Hawaii uh, for a month. Um, so that, that was, that was nice. Um, it's, it was amazing. Uh, we have really large facilities in uh, Maui, Hawaii. And then also on the uh, big island, there's a smaller research um, uh, facility for Monsanto. Um, uh, Maui is our main, uh, where we do a lot of pre-commercial stuff as well. So that's mainly where I went. And then I went to a, uh, the island of Molokai uh, for a month, which was a very small island that Monsanto had a, a farm on. It basically had, you know, 
basically I think two roads on the whole island. It was it was very small. So those were those that was a lot of fun getting to meet a lot of people. Um, basically in the early stages of Monsanto, you you'd be with a group of thirty people from the U.S. on different from different uh, research groups, and you'd spend a month together working uh, in the fields in Hawaii. So it's a good way to to really build relationships with other people from other groups, you know, throughout the U.S. So, um, but that's, that's all come to a stop the last 12 years or last, you know, eight years I've been with, with as, as the agronomist, but I, you know, I still travel to talk to farmers some here and there, but uh, nothing like I did got to uh, do in the winter in small pot research. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what education um, or certifications different of those requirements are needed to get into your specific career? And I know you each kind of have a different focus. I can go ahead and go. Uh, for mine, for your degree um, is what I have to get into my position. Uh, they when they post, post the postings for the jobs, they like to have, you know, three to four years of experience in sales. Uh, but with the associate position that I came in on, it was straight out of college. They hire, you know, they hired, I think, 17 of us across um, Compeer in two different sections. So it was like six in January and then the rest in um, August when we started. Um, and so just the four-year degree, uh, if you want to move up in the company, they do would uh, want some other management skills or management experience or a graduate degree. Yeah, so I, I had my four-year bachelor's in agronomy, um, but I would say with a company, you know, like Monsanto and Albear or any of the other larger ag companies, um, if you do have the ability or the desire to get your master's and stay in school, you know, if you're young, with me taking time off, I was, I was 26 when I graduated. So, you know, I was ready to, I was told I was needed to get out and start working. So, um, <laughs> I, and I had a job lined up as well, but my advice would be if you, uh, you know, if you have the time and you're graduating and you know, you're 21, 22, just to take the extra time or, or year and a half or two years and get your master's, it's going to open up you know, there's a lot of jobs that, you know, I, I'm perfectly qualified for, but with a large organizations that I think, you know, we're all from, I think they would probably agree that, you know, you can have all the experience you want, but sometimes they really want those, you know, a, a master's or a PhD. Um, so, you know, if, if you have the desire and you, maybe you don't have a desire, whoever, you know, some people don't like school, but if you could knock it out for another two years, it's going to be worth your while the next 30 years in your career to possibly make a heck of a lot more money or have those opportunities to advance. Yeah, I think I'll echo the same thing there. I, I went to Western Illinois University and uh, majored in ag business. I had an ag technology management minor and a general business minor. Uh, that really helps you get in your foot in the door. It doesn't keep you there, but it helps you get your foot in the door and get started. And then, of course, from there, you have to prove yourself and uh, your work ethic that you have from growing up on a farm or, or helping family members and their businesses, things like that. Uh, you got to have that same work ethic in a company, in a business. And uh, that's really what helps keep you there. But to get your foot in the door, uh, like Jimmy and Amy said, yeah, it's that bachelor's degree that really helps. Uh, a master's degree, they really like to see too, especially in some upper management or more specialized roles like lead engineers, things like that. So uh, it definitely helps. Uh, there are people that work for this company that don't have degrees, but it's required that they had that work experience prior. And, and sometimes it's hard to get that work experience prior without the degree. So uh, the degree will get you there sometimes a little bit sooner, uh, but I uh, still got to put in the work after that. So as I've mentioned, I'm currently in a rotational program. Um, I will post out of it here later this year. For the role I'm in or the rotational program I'm in, just a technical education is enough. It doesn't have to be an engineering degree. So, you know, if you're looking at Iowa State or Purdue, 
I think it's like ag systems management or ag management technology at Illinois. It's called technical systems management. Those are, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, uh, numbers better than words. Um, <laughs> something technical. And I do know people who have maybe an ag business degree that have gotten a role based on experience they've already had. So it all kind of depends. And with Deer, I can't speak to any other company. Once you have an internship and you keep taking internships with them, there's a decent chance that you'll get a full-time offer for, from them when you graduate. Great, thank you all. And, and Chris, that leads nicely. Um, and you all spoke a little bit about it, but if you want to expand for me, what opportunities exist for growth within your career path? I'll go ahead. Growth uh, with my career path. So I'm in the sales role right now as a financial officer. Um, if I was to move up, I'd be moving out of the sales role. So that would just depend um, down the road if I wanted to give up my clients to have someone else take them over and then me manage the um, financial officers in our marketplace, then I could do that. Um, but management roles are would be the next step to move up in my role. Uh, we also come here is very flexible with, you know, if I got into a sales role and realized I didn't necessarily like lending money to people or I uh, didn't want to be in the sales role, then I have the opportunity to make the internal transfers and apply for different jobs within the company. They're um, normally really good about making sure that you feel in the right place and um, where you want to be. So if I wanted to jump to crop insurance, then if there was openings and I had the conversations with my boss, I could do that. Uh, but as far as moving up or to the next level, it would be um, management roles, such as my boss's job who oversees the FOs um, or his boss that would do the oversees the managers of the FOs. So just uh, layers of management would be the next next step. So as I mentioned before, you know, kind of where where I'm at now is the learning center agronomist. My next step would be would be to you know look at as a technical agronomist for for a brand, you know, for a certain company for you know to support sales, uh, you know, support you know three or four district sales managers, or also lean into a role of a district sales manager um, with a, with a company, you know, whether it's uh, you know Pioneer, Decal, Asgro, Channel. Um, that's kind of the next step I would think um, would be leading in towards, you know, when I first started um, my career, you know, 20 years ago, I was a research technician and then went to a research assistant, then a research associate, then a learning center agronomist. So then you got to always be looking to see where your next step would be if you choose to, you know, keep jumping career goals. Yeah, always keep your eye open, I would say, uh, for your next opportunity, because it may not be something that you expect. Uh, I got into training for that reason. I, I started in the company as a field representative uh, in a rotational program, similar to what Chris is doing. Uh, I then was a, a remote service rep, so I handled some of our smaller dealership locations. And I got a call from the trainer who I'd worked with in a rotational program and said he was moving on to another role and recommended me for the position. And that's how I got into technical training about five years ago uh, and then progressed into the management role. So it, some of those things you may not always have on your radar, so to speak, of where you're going to go next. For me, uh, opportunities of growth would be uh, managing other teams within the company, possibly jumping to uh, project management or uh, product product marketing manager or product management of really taking a product line like backhoes or skid steers, something like that to uh, manage and work with a little bit closer. So uh, opportunities uh, really are endless. Sometimes I, I get a little narrow-minded in where I think I should go, uh, but where I can go might come up uh, out of nowhere. So always, as Jimmy just said, keep your mind open and be looking for that uh, next career move. 
Wonderful. Thank you all. And it's so great to hear that there are so many opportunities for um, getting in a career and advancing within that career track um, available to those interested in agriculture. What recommendations would you make to a high school student who's hoping to go into agriculture? So, so I make the same recommendation I, you know, did before about, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in ag and, and nowadays you can be involved in ag and, you know, we all grew up on a family farm, right? Um, there's positions within ag companies now that we have people that work for us that are in the middle, you know, in California or don't even know the difference between corn and soybeans because I've had those people at the farm and trained them. Um, you know, with our climate group that we own, um, they, we had groups that come through every two weeks from Seattle or California, and they don't know the difference between a corn and soybean plant. So there is opportunities out there, even if you aren't, and don't think you have to be from a family farm to go into ag because, you know, ag is a very, has been very good, you know, um, to me and to all of us, I think it will be in the end. Um, so don't think you have to just be from a farm to be involved in ag. And, you know, I have a lot of high school groups come through the learning center and I tell them that exact same thing you know we we did a uh, a plot we do a plot for each high school within the area we kind of make it a contest to see who can get the highest yield so in 2019 we had 21 high schools and we've been doing this for about six years so we've had roughly 2,500 or 3,000 high school students come through that I've talked with and you know about this as well so there's multiple opportunities. You think of computers, you think of digital ag, you think of everything, you know, it, it just, it's not just about putting a seed in the ground and growing and harvesting it anymore. It, there's a lot that goes into it. So just pursue, you know, what you want to and, and keep your mind open because there's going to be so many different options, you know, um, and, you know, just if you can get that master's and, and, and take advantage of the schooling while you can and, you know, be involved and get experience in multiple ways you can and in clubs and, and, and be willing to, you know, like, you know, like Dan said, once you get there, take your work ethic with you and, and make a name for yourself because nobody's going to hand you anything anymore. You got to, you know, well, they want to hand you stuff now more than they did before, but, <laughs> um, but you need to work hard to get, to get where you need to go. Um, and, you know, just stay open-minded and, and, you know, there's so many opportunities out there than what, what there was 20 years ago, you know, or even 20, 10 years ago, even five years ago. So the ag industry is changing so fast and every industry is. So just keep an open mind and just work towards whatever goal you want. I'm gonna take what Jimmy just said and kind of flip it around. If you do come from an ag background and want to work in ag, don't think you can only study ag in college to get into ag. Um, like I mentioned, I have an ag background. I don't have an ag degree. So think through everything before you make any decisions. Um, because like I said, you know, and like Jimmy said, there's a lot more to ag than I think a lot of people on the outside don't realize. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I have an ag background, I have an ag degree, but I know probably 50% of our employees with Compere do not have an ag background. Um, there's just a variety of different things that you can get into, especially on the finance side that don't require um, that ag knowledge and the ag background for that. As far as advice in college goes, um, keep an open mind and get involved as much as you can. So I was involved in Oh, I don't need a, a ton of clubs. Every, basically, every club that I could be in, I was in, as, as long as time allowed. Um, involved in everything, uh, take a variety of classes. I mean, I uh, wish out of, I'm not in college anymore. When I was in college, I wish I would have took agronomy classes because that's one thing I didn't take. Um, and I wish I would have. But as far as all the other classes, um, I took a variety of different ag econ classes, ag finance classes, soil classes, animal classes, um, just to see exactly where um, I fell within the ag industry and what I liked the most. Um, yeah, and so being involved, learning the different backgrounds of other people and kind of what they're interested in, the different classes, um, and just having that open mind. Yeah, I would say think about what you like doing today 
uh, is it something outside or something with a computer and try to be the best at it and use use what you like to do and and find a job that you can do that with because if you if you like doing it it doesn't feel like work all the time right so if you enjoy what you do it it really helps so as a high schooler i would say take take advantage of uh sometimes there's ride-alongs you can do with salesmen whether it's a, a seed seed salesman or whether it's at, at a dealership or shadow a service manager or technician at a dealership if you have the opportunity um part-time jobs uh, as high schoolers i mean we have a, a college a high school co-op and college co-op program uh through cnh uh that can be done, especially people in the local area can participate in that. That's really helpful and valuable for those people who take advantage of that. Uh, so I would say take take the opportunities as they come to you, uh, but don't sit there and wait on opportunities. Seek those out. Contact a farmer if you're not familiar with farming or don't have a farming background and see if they're looking for some part time help, you know, after school or uh, on the weekends, whatever it might be. And, you might be stuck cleaning a header or you might be stuck, you know, cleaning out the grain tank or the grain bins and running a sweep auger. But, you know, that everybody's got to start somewhere. And even even the farmers that are 70, 80 years old, they're still doing that because that's a skill they had to learn. So I would say take every opportunity that you have. Wonderful. Thank you all. And I've had um, a couple questions come into the chat box. Um, we are going to go ahead and I will get started on that first one and then I invite you if you have those to prepare um, when we get a moment you will be able to unmute yourself or go ahead and send it in the chat box and I'm happy to ask it on your behalf. Um, the first one would be geared um, towards you Dan and Chris and that is what is the best way to get involved into an equipment tech or a mechanic type career. Uh, I would say from my perspective, and we're actually uh, looking at like a technician recruitment program and, and have partnerships with colleges, tech colleges and high schools. Uh, it's those technical skills, uh, electrical, hydraulic, how do you turn a wrench to take one part off to get to another part uh, and fix that part, troubleshoot it. Uh, it. A lot of those technical skills are good. You also do have to have computer skills. So you have to be able to look at what's the computer telling me to do and then use your head and being able to read a schematic. Okay, now what do I actually need to do to fix this? Because the computer might not tell me everything that I need to do. So it, it's really having that troubleshooting mentality and Chris can probably add on to that. I can to some degree. Uh, my advice would be if you wanna be a deer technician, go to a local deer dealer and make your interest known. They may not have a need for you, but across the country, there is a shortage of deer technicians. So they will have resources to provide you on where to go to get training and where you might be able to find a job. And Dan, I can't speak for CNH, but I know deer dealers, if they want to hire you, will often sponsor you to go to a technical program like you spoke of to alleviate the cost. Um, again, though, echoing what Dan said, curiosity, you know, wondering how things work and trying to figure them out yourself is invaluable for a technician because sometimes stuff isn't obvious. Sometimes you question what engineers were thinking and you just have to figure it out and it's not always fun. Alrighty, let me offer this opportunity right now. If you had a question that you wanted to um, unmute and ask, otherwise, again, you can still send that into the chat box. I'm gonna give it a moment to see if someone unmutes themselves. Okay. Uh, while, while you're waiting there, yeah. uh, just to add on to what Chris mentioned too, uh, everybody's surfing YouTube, looking at the videos and on TikTok and looking at all that stuff. There's some repair tips, believe it or not, on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but I get them sent to me sometimes. Uh, 
there on YouTube, there are a lot of good free videos to watch if you're interested in being a technician or in any any role. I'm sure there's a lot of agronomy videos on there as well. And uh, so I would say for sure, seek some of those free resources out. Not everything has to be paid for. Uh, there's a lot of free information that's out there now. That's a great point, Dan. Um, an awesome resource that we're going to have on YouTube on the um, University of Illinois Extension YouTube are these backlogs of recordings. So if you weren't able to join us um, for our first two on production agriculture and for ag sales, we'll have those. And then we've still got coming up veterinary medicine and ag education and outreach. Um, one great example of things that are on YouTube. Um, another question that I had come in, and I think um, this will be kind of our final question, and then we'll open it for your for you all to give your final thoughts. Um, a couple of you spoke about your internships being how you got involved in this career path. What advice do you have for people who are maybe searching for internships? So yeah, I was fortunate to get hired during an internship. So I would say if if you are interested in, you know, whatever part of ag it is, if there's an opportunity for an internship, definitely apply for that because that's one way to get your, your foot in the door and, and prove yourself and that that is what you're in. And, and also it can make you double check yourself if that's what you want to make sure you want to do for a living um, and or at least maybe just do it to get in the door. But, you know, I would take advantage of any internship available, um, you know, that's closely related to what what you're kind of wanting to pursue. Yeah, I, I too got hired from internship with CNH and I interned with John Deere before that and product development in Silvis, Illinois, uh, there at the Quad Cities. So I, yeah, it, take the opportunities, right? I, I thought after my John Deere internship, I would work at John Deere and have another John Deere internship and then CNH beat them to the offer for the next year internship. <laughs> so I took, I took it, you know, I, I was really debating on whether or not to take it or not. And, um, I'm glad I did because they ended up offering me uh, before I started my first day of senior year in college. I had a job offer for full time employment after my uh, college career was done. So uh, those internships absolutely help. So for me, my advice would be. If your school has a career fair or if companies put on information nights, maybe prior to a career fair, make sure you go um, ask questions at the info nights. Make sure you have resumes to hand out at the career fairs and don't be scared to tailor your resumes to highlight why you think you would be a good fit for that company. You know, say you want to intern at Compeer and you may have some sales experience, whether it be a retail job or something of na that nature, highlight that. Or maybe you want to come and work for Deer or CNH and you're also a farmhand for somebody. Highlight your machinery experience. You know, with an internship, it's a first impression. It is a three month first impression for a company to form an opinion of you. So you want to do everything in your power to put your best foot forward. Yeah, and I would back that up. I, I didn't have any internships personally. Um, I actually took a different path and did sports in college. And so those took up all of my summers. And I didn't have time to um, pursue an internship. Uh, I was the only one in my group that did not have an internship with Compeer before I got hired. Um, so it's they do hire their interns. So definitely apply and get out there in front of the companies. The reason that um, I had a good you know, reputation with this company that I work for is because I did go to that career fair and I did go to the acquaintance night prior to the career fair in college. And so I um, made my connection there, you know, told them I was really interested and did my first impression. And then the next day when we had the internship fair, they actually um, pulled me to their booth three times to come talk just to have more knowledge, um, but an internship definitely would have helped. So I wouldn't have had to work so hard uh, to get my foot in the door and make them know who I was and make them know I was worthy of a job with them. Um, internships definitely 
um, definitely help a lot. Wonderful. Um, and so now I would invite you all, if there's anything that you wanted to share or that we didn't get a chance to talk about, um, if you'd like to share kind of your final thoughts, pieces of advice with the group, I would ask that you do that now. Um, I'd touch on the resume part. Uh, Chris mentioned it earlier, but definitely tailoring your resume to kind of what jobs you are applying for, make those necessary changes. Uh, always follow up with an employer after you talk to them or after um, you do an interview process. Uh, tailor your cover letters. Just make sure it's more specific to the job because a lot of, they'll have a lot of applications come in and you need to have your standout. A piece of advice I have, okay, you've gone to the career fair, and yes, you have an interview. Congratulations. At the interview, ask for a business card, because in my experience, people always have them on them, and send them a handwritten thank you note. If for no other reason, then they see your name again, and think back to your interview, hopefully before they make the decision on who to hire. I would say, you know, once you decide or and you may not know right away when you're in school, but the biggest thing is when you're in school, go to school, um, go to class. Um, you may think you're really busy when you're in school and maybe you want to work a lot or you need to work a lot, but you have your whole life to work and you just have those few those four to six years to focus on your career. So because you're going to be a lot more busy when you get out of school than you are when you were in school. So just, you know, really focus and, and get up and go to class. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. Show, show your, the work ethic that you wanna have uh, an employer see, show that to your teachers, show that to your uh, guidance counselors, things like that. You know, uh, I believe everybody's mentioned it by this time, but get involved that's the best way that uh, a guidance counselor, a teacher, uh, a, a club advisor, that's the best way they're gonna get to know you is if you're involved and engaged and companies call them. If, if they know you're coming from a college or you're coming from a, a high school, they're gonna reach out and they're gonna ask what their opinions are of you. So it's never too late to have that impression of yourself, get involved. It, it doesn't have to be a job. Uh, as Jimmy mentioned, you, you only have so much time uh, in high school or in college. So use that to your advantage, get involved in sports, get involved in clubs. It's those leadership skills and soft skills that you learn and use in those clubs that will really help you uh, in the business world as well. So uh, yeah, I would say same thing uh, everyone else has said is get involved, stay engaged, show that initiative and build those relationships because I'm sure you've all heard it. It's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know that helps you get your foot in the door sometimes. Wonderful. Thank you all again so much for um, coming to, um, to experience this career exploration event. And thank you to our speakers, Chris, Amy, Jimmy, and Dan. We really appreciate you um, sharing your expertise with us today.